They were a revolution in warfare, the LST, the landing ship tank. Built so fast, so numerous, considered so expendable, they weren't even given names. But they went on to be the deciding factor in the defining war of the 20th century. How does a class of ship with light defenses and sometimes the wrong kinds of guns survive some of the deadliest invasions in history? What kind of crew brings a ship back from near death and return it to glory? The LST, the temporary ship that made a permanent impact on the world. Guys, what you're gonna wanna do is you're gonna wanna brace yourself, all right? Grab the man in front of you, because you're gonna hold him from falling, he's gonna hold another guy behind you, he's gonna hold you from falling, all right? Keep your weapon down, all right? That way he doesn't smack you in the back of the head and bust you, all right? But brace yourself, get ready for the impact, keep your knees bent, you'll be fine. June 2007, 63 years after it fought in the most decisive battle in World War II, this LST is back in action at the site of an annual D-Day memorial event on the shores of the Ohio River in Evansville, Indiana. Evansville was a, was a manufacturing plant for LSTs, P-47 fighter planes, and some arms and munitions. It's a real uh, a special thing for Evansville to have this LST here. Uh, a lot, there's a lot of uh, personal ties. The invasion of Normandy is an epic moment in world history. Come out here and you recreate battles and you, and you get in this original gear and you try and convey to the public what it might have been like and the sacrifice that these young men made 60 years ago. For a veteran to come up to you and say thank you and wanting to shake your hand, that's an honor when you should be thanking them. It's, it doesn't get any better than that. But only recently has the LST taken its rightful place in that history. The LST has made, made winning that war possible. They were absolutely necessary to win that war. There were over 1,000 of these landing ship tanks made during World War II, all within a three-year period. This ship, now christened the USS LST Ship Memorial, was one of the 229 that made D-Day at Normandy possible. Today, she is the only functioning World War II LST in the United States. Many of them were given away, many of them were sank, uh, many were blown up in atomic nuclear tests uh, during the 50s. So they were not something that were uh, high priority to save, and it's lucky we have the 325. Now restored to her original 1940s appearance, she's still able to steam under her own power. How did a crew of aging veterans find it in Greece, repair it, and bring it back through the Mediterranean and across the Atlantic? Of course, we accomplished something that most people said we'd never do. The Coast Guard said we weren't safe and we were too old. The fact that 60 years after her heroics, people have gathered to thank a class of ships rather than an individual vessel is a testament to the role that she played during World War II. The Nazi war machine seemed unstoppable as it plowed its way through Europe with frightening speed. 
German newsreel footage glorifies the powerful and heavily armored panzer tanks. Time was running out for the Allies. The longer they waited, the more entrenched the Germans would be. The Allies ratchet up production of Stuart and Sherman tanks at factories like this Chrysler plant in Michigan. Nearly 25,000 tanks were built by Chrysler between 1941 and 1945. Tanks is what we needed, and we knew that they had maybe greater tanks than we had, and uh, it just had, had a lot of number of them in order to achieve our, our goal. And the only way to deliver those tanks would be through ports. But when the Germans take over Western Europe, they start preparing massive defenses, like here at the port of Dieppe and every other city with a harbor. Five thousand one hundred Canadian troops, along with one thousand British commandos and U.S. Army Rangers, raid the northern French port of Dieppe. The Allies are completely humiliated. Without the use of tanks, three quarters of the Canadians are killed, wounded, or taken prisoner in just six hours. Winston Churchill decides that there must be another method of bringing those men and materiel. They need access to beaches without relying on ports. So they got together and they decided an entirely new type of ship was needed. And that turned out to be the LST. And the amphibious navy was born. This cavernous tank deck is what the LST is all about. Because in here you can carry 20 Sherman or Churchill medium tanks, 39 Stuart light tanks, or 17 amphibious tractors and delivering these fighting vehicles to the invasion beaches in Normandy was crucial to the success of Operation Overlord, the D-Day invasion. But with entrenched batteries firing at them, like these cannons set into poured concrete, they run the risk of being blown to bits before they can get the tanks off. To unload a cargo ship in the traditional way at a wharf using cranes would take too long. The solution was radical. They cut the bow off, installed two doors. Behind that, a 68-foot-long ramp. That became the hallmark of every LST. To a ship designer, it was heresy to cut a hole in a ship. But this ramp and those doors is what made the LST capable of doing what it did so well. The first LSTs are to prove their worth at the next major invasion, Operation Torch the battle for North Africa. The LSTs beach at 4 a.m. They're carrying American-made Stuart-like tanks, but there's a problem. They're not shallow draft enough to make it close enough into the beach to launch the tanks. So their crewmen go to work building pontoon bridges. On two of them, it takes three agonizing hours to get the bridges ready. On one of them, four excruciating hours to get the bridges ready to begin launching the tanks. In the end, the tanks with their supporting infantry capture two crucial airfields, and the unloading process is dramatically faster than the old way of using a cargo ship and a wharf, but it's still not fast enough. But some of the elements of these experimental ships are breakthroughs. The bow doors and the use of the rear anchor to dislodge beach ships are both major advances. I'm here on the stern of an LST, right by the stern winch. The stern winch assembly was one of the important features of an LST that made it so useful, so effective as a war-winning weapon. Here's how it worked. As the LST approached the beach, it would drop this, a 3,000-pound stern anchor, a ton and a half. The anchor would sink to the bottom, and with pivoting cleats here, dig in. And then when the LST was ready to depart, it would simply use this winch to reel itself and pull itself off the beach using that 3,000 pound stern anchor line. 
Once the LSD had pulled itself back off into deeper water, it could turn around and return to port to take on more cargo. And that was at the heart of Allied strategy during World War II. The ability to not just make an opposed amphibious landing, but then to support it. And supporting it came from ships just like this. Britain has the shipmaking skill to produce the proposed LSTs, but their shipyards are already overtaxed. So Churchill turns to US shipyards like this one in Richmond, California where 747 ships were constructed, more than anywhere else in the world. But this adds another challenge, transatlantic seafaring. flat bottom ships like this oil tanker are notoriously easy to capsize since they ride so high in the water. The ships that cross the Atlantic have deep drafts. How can a ship ride high enough to beach itself and ride low enough to make it across the Atlantic? Centuries of shipbuilding knowledge says that if you have one, you can't have the other. In November 1941, admirals from Britain arrive in the US to discuss the problem. Within a few days, John Niedermeyer of the Bureau of Ships makes an array of fateful sketches. Right here is the brilliance of John Niedermeyer. This is the LST's ballast control system. By turning these valves, gigantic ballast tanks can pump in over 1,500 gallons of seawater per minute from the surrounding ocean, making the ship heavier, making it sit lower in the water, low enough to cross the Atlantic Ocean without capsizing. When beaching operations commence, the crew shifts the ballast so the ship will remain level on the beach. After the operations, they pump the ballast out, making the ship light enough to be able to pry itself off the beach. Manufacturers, some that have never built a ship before and staffed largely by women, get to work. It is a fury of production. There were so many of them. Uh, they didn't bother naming them. The crews of 120 men and the hundreds of troops brought on board the LSTs would have to refer to their new homes simply by a number. The program is off and running. But will the manufacturers be up to the challenge? Can they build these LSTs properly and in the numbers that are needed? for the unprecedented invasion that the Allies are planning. The clock is ticking. Less than a year after John Niedermeyer's first rough sketches, LST-1 is launched and begins sea trials. No one thought that these ships would be fast, but in the end, the drag was far worse than everyone expected, and the best average speed that an LST could make was 10 knots, 12 miles per hour. And at that rate of speed, it didn't take long for crew members to begin to suggest that the initials LST didn't stand for landing ship tank, but for long, slow target. The first LSTs take an average of four months to build. Before long, the figure is cut to two months, a blistering pace. But even at this pace, it wasn't enough for Churchill and General Eisenhower. They knew the sooner they invaded Europe, the better, and they couldn't make the invasion without these ships. At the same time as these new ships are created, so are new sailors, just emerging from their basic training. First time I saw an LSC was at Pier 92, New York. I didn't have any idea in the world what it was even. I was green, new to the Navy, and I hadn't been on cruisers or battle wagons or anything like that. I'm not so sure 
there was mo wasn't more than maybe three people that had ever been to sea before. I think our captain had been to sea, but it, on his yacht. Although the LSTs are big, the flat bottoms make them unstable. So many of us were seasick. And if you're hitting head on into the waves, uh, the bow would come up and the stern would go down and the whole ship would just shake. You'd swear it was gonna break in two. Awaiting these new ships with their new sailors, the first step toward conquering Europe the invasion of the island of Sicily. With Operation Husky, LSTs will get their trial by fire. They had no idea how that ship was going to work. The crews of the LSTs deliver their cargo of troops, rarely going out of their way to get to know them. Didn't learn their names, uh, didn't get acquainted with them. Maybe subconsciously, we didn't want to know. It took a team to make the opposed amphibious landing operations of World War II possible. And that team was the LST and the LCVP, what the GIs called the Higgins boat. And one of the devices that made that team function together effectively was the davit system that you see behind me. It made it possible to launch the boats and then bring the boats back on board ship. Now, the LCVPs were only used when you came close into shore and you could launch them. They had a limited range. And so this davit system was absolutely crucial for the use of this type of landing craft in combat. Each hour for Sicily is 3.45 in the morning. We had a terrific storm the day before we went into the beach. We were very concerned over the troops at that time because they were seasick all night. But when it came time to uh, go ashore, they couldn't wait to get off the ship. <laughs> The LSTs released their Higgins boats to make the initial assault. We had no idea what kind of opposition we were going to get. I was never really scared, but the more we did, the more landing sailing, the more I began to realize, maybe I'll make it. Fire! Here at the port of Jela, the resistance is brutal. LSTs regularly found themselves in the line of fire during World War II, and they weren't armored, so even something as small as a shell could penetrate the deck like you see right here. In the case of LST-313, she was hit by a German bomb that punched straight through this upper deck to explode inside the tank deck, which was still full of vehicles. The explosion created an inferno that threatened to engulf the entire ship. Simply put, the men inside this space were doomed. By the middle of August, the invasion of Sicily is declared a success. But taking the island of Sicily is merely a stepping stone to the ultimate goal, the conquest of continental Europe. And after the invasion of Sicily, we made the invasion of uh, Italy. Again, the first wave is handled by smaller landing craft, like the Higgins boats. In the final moments before hitting the beach, the 36 men inside the squad bay of the LCVP would brace themselves. They'd be down on one knee. They're getting ready to land. They'd hold on tight, because when the LCVP hits the beach, it lurches forward. Now, at that moment of beaching, the ramp would also drop. Like Sicily, the Salerno invasion is considered a victory, thanks to the LST. At the same time, half a world away in the Pacific theater, LSTs are starting to make themselves heard. The small boat's LST partnership becomes a successful tactic. But in many cases, the beach is still full of enemy artillery as the LSTs come in. That was the case in New Guinea. The amphibious landing craft become sitting ducks as they approach the beach. 
This is the wheelhouse of an LST. Imagine the chaos on the 473 with a Japanese torpedo in the water approaching the ship. Then simultaneously, Japanese bombers appear in the air above the ship, dropping bombs, one of which lands very close to this spot, exploding, killing everyone on the bridge and mortally wounding Johnny Hutchins. Then he somehow finds the strength to take the helm and to steer the ship out of the path of the approaching torpedo. So with his last living act, Johnny Hutchins saves his ship and the lives of everyone on it. Even as the shipyards increase production, General Eisenhower and the Allied High Command at their headquarters here in southern England are getting more and more impatient. To execute Operation Overlord, the invasion of France, they want to have close to 250 dedicated LSTs. With the supply of LSTs critically low, D-Day is postponed a month to June 1st. May 1944, ammo is being loaded onto LST 353 at Pearl Harbor. A massive explosion rips through LST 353 and the four other ships nested with her, LST-39, LST-43, LST-179, and LST-480, destroying all five ships. At a time when each and every LST was so incredibly important, the loss of five in one day to an operational accident was a terrible blow. But a worse blow comes from an area from which it is least expected, a training exercise. It's a setback that could jeopardize the war in Europe and the fate of the world. In 1944, as the invasion of Europe approaches, Military exercises like these are being conducted across southern England. The mock landing scheduled for April 28th is part of Exercise Tiger. So it was a full-scale rehearsal, live weapons, live ammunition, and landing the 4th Division on Slapton Sands, which was an area that we used for training in the English Channel. But with German vessels like these e-boats patrolling the waters around Great Britain, at any time, this can turn from an exercise to a full-blown battle. Unfortunately, two British ships had been assigned originally to escort the LSTs, and one of those ships had some damage to it earlier in the day, so the English Admiral in Devon ordered that ship back into port for repair, but did not notify Admiral Moon or anybody else in the American Navy about it. A convoy of eight vessels on strict orders of radio silence had no idea that they were almost completely unprotected. Across the channel, the activity arouses the attention of a pack of nine German e-boats. An e-boat is what the Germans called Schmel Schnellbotten, which means fast boat. They were similar to a patrol boat, like a PT boat in our Navy, only larger, faster, and more heavily armed. To the E-boats, these long, slow targets lumbering along at 10 knots are easy prey. The enemy knew that they did carry a lot of equipment and that they were a primary target. As the evening of April 27th turns to the morning of April 28th, all hell breaks loose. Before dawn on April 28th, the men on duty here in the engine room heard the ominous sound of metal scraping on metal. Soldiers and sailors all over the LST heard the same noise, and what they were hearing was a near miss as a German torpedo scraped along the underside of the LST as it passed. 30 minutes later, they weren't so lucky. A young sailor by the name of Angelo Crapanzano was standing right here 
when he heard a tremendous explosion and he felt the shock and then water rushed into the compartment. The torpedo hit in the auxiliary engine room just over there, killing every man in that room instantly. She's so severely hit, there is no abandoning ship order, there's no general quarters. About 10 minutes later, the 531 is hit by two torpedoes. Because it was such a horrific surprise attack, really couldn't do much to defend themselves. The 507 and the 531 both slip under the waves. Oil slicks from the damage catch fire. Men in the water are surrounded by the flames. After the first ships are hit in the attack, the captain orders 17-year-old seaman Tom Glenn to go aft and wake up all of the sailors and soldiers that were sleeping there. So Glenn turns and exits this way. So with the practice invasion fleet under attack by German E-boats, he had to come out of the wheelhouse, run down these stairs to the weather deck, and then continue aft to go through this hatch, which would give him access to a stairwell leading him to the berthing deck. Finally, he could tell the men in the berthing compartment, wake up, get out of your racks, this is no drill. Minutes later, the stern of LST-289 was a mass of twisted, smoking debris as the torpedo hit and exploded. Had it not been for Tom Glenn's fast feet, all of the men in this compartment would have been dead. I was scared one scared kid, I'll tell you that. The stations on shore have not been alerted to the maneuvers and have no idea what to make of the frantic signals. About 2 o'clock in the morning, we did receive a message from the LSTs. They thought they'd been torpedoed by submarines. And to make matters worse, due to a typo in the orders, nearby ships are on a different frequency. Help is not coming. The exception of those that were hit immediately, virtually all of the LSTs fired back in defense. Total, they say the loss of life was 790-something or 780-something. They lost their life in one hour that night. As the survivors are treated, they get an unusual order. And they had an officer come in and told us what happened last night never happened. You're not to talk about it on the threat of court martial. The Exercise Tiger disaster would bring on many changes, probably the most important of which would take place in radio rooms like this. They knew that they could never afford to have another communications breakdown of the type that they did on the night of April 28, 1944. They had to overcome basic problems, like having everyone transmit on the same frequency when they distributed SOS calls. They also learned that they would have to protect the LSTs better. Those ships would be vital and key to the success of the invasion of Europe. There wasn't enough time to produce as many LSTs as they really needed. So when we lost three LSTs in Exercise Tiger, there was even some concern that they might have to postpone the Normandy landings. For every day the invasion is delayed, untold lives are being lost. The Germans are getting even more entrenched in their positions in France. As seen in these propaganda films, Extensive concrete and iron anti-tank and anti-personnel barriers are built along the coast. The Allies fear that the longer they wait, the greater chance they will lose the element of surprise. Each year, on the anniversary of Exercise Tiger, the Coast Guard conducts a wreath-laying ceremony. Between the secrecy of Exercise Tiger and the overshadowing fame of D-Day at Normandy, this event is still little known. But it isn't forgotten by those who were there. And that by the time the Normandy operation was over, people had forgotten even about Exercise Tiger. And a lot of the men that have been survivors 
were still under the impression that they were not allowed to talk about it. And the stories about it actually came out much, much later. With the loss of three LSTs in Exercise Tiger, Supreme Commander Dwight D. Eisenhower considers postponing D-Day in Normandy once again. If they wait just one more week, 168 American and 61 British LSTs would be amassed, and the tide would be rising, and that would have to do. Weather permitting, the date will be June 5, 1944. The journey from England to Normandy on a battle-loaded LST could take from 10 to 16 hours. You can just imagine the men in this very birthing compartment, sitting here, talking, playing cards, trying to distract themselves, trying not to get seasick, because after all, there was a storm in the English Channel at the time. Maybe they'd come back to their bunk to get some sleep, maybe look at a few photographs, write a last letter or two generally passing the time, passing what could be their final hours alone and scared. The boats from LST-376 are trained on Omaha Beach. We were all scared because we were going to unknown uh, country and we had no idea what lay ahead for us, so uh, yeah, we were scared. After yet another weather delay, the D-Day invasion finally commences on June 6, 1944. Hello, as soon as the LSD dropped anchor, small boat people knew then what the next move was, and that was to get troops in your small boat in, in the water. And then we headed for the beach. We had about 12 miles to go. It was pretty quiet, a pretty solemn trip in. Of course, they was all scared, and I was scared. The fire wasn't too heavy at first, but the closer we got, the more fire come down. All of a sudden, there was explosions, and I felt the water come rushing in. And uh, I think I was the last one leaving the boat. The tide was coming in, and the bodies were washing in. It was pretty gruesome. And I laid amongst the bodies when they come in there. They protected me. Woodyard makes it to a transport headed for Portsmouth, England. Now, after living through hell, Woodyard boards this ship, the LST-376, for a second trip back to the Normandy beachhead. This is the aft twin 40 millimeter anti-aircraft gun tub. Donald Newell was stationed here on LST 376 as she steamed back toward Normandy. Suddenly, enemy E-boats are sighted. When the attack began, Donald Newell and the crew of this weapon were prepared to defend against an aerial attack. So with fast moving E-boats in the water, they had to struggle to spin the weapon around and bring down the muzzles so that they could direct fire against the enemy. It was a race against time because those German E-boats were about to release their torpedoes. By the time I got to my station, I was on the main deck, and you look forward, there's all kinds of, of fire and, and explosions. I uh, was knocked off my feet, and when I went down, I, I cut my chin on a gun tub. Picture LST-376, loaded to the brim with vehicles, all of which were fully fueled with gasoline, volatile gasoline. When a German torpedo struck in about this area, LST-376 immediately burst into flames, became an inferno. It wasn't long before her captain gave the order to abandon ship. 
I know I was in the water at least two hours when I remembered I had a life belt on, so I reached down and squeezed that. I didn't notice the cold in the water. I guess that's because I was too darn scared. We got in the water, it was cold. After a long time, I noticed soldiers dropping off. I told my buddy, his name was Don Williams. I told Don, I said, I'm about gone. And he pulled me in under the life raft and got back in the water himself. Finally, the British destroyer HMS Beagle arrives and starts scooping up the survivors, most of whom had been in the water three hours. By September 15th, LST-325 has served over 100 days at Normandy. Loading and unloading and making the 10 to 16 hour trip 20 times both ways. The men are anticipating a break. We had no leave. We, we worked all the time. We got tired, especially uh, during some of the operations where we would go for 48 hours straight. We did what we had to do. On May 8th, Victory is declared in Europe. By the time it leaves Europe in May, the 325 will have made 44 trips across the English Channel. After Germany was defeated, a lot of LSTs that were in the Atlantic went to the Pacific. And we wouldn't have taken the islands in the Pacific without the LST. But before the additional LSTs can reach their sister ships in the Pacific, Japan surrenders. The so-called expendable LSTs turn out to be among the most durable ships in the Navy. Of the original 1,050 ships, well over 1,000 survive. Too many for a peacetime Navy to maintain. Some are mothballed, some are junked, some are sold to friendly navies. Some serve their country one last time as target practice. Many of those World War II era ships would be taken out of mothballs and recommissioned to serve in Korea, fighting with distinction at the Incheon invasion. There again, we're bringing in heavy equipment. The Incheon landing, which the, the North Koreans didn't think we could do because it was too shallow. But again, the, the World War II LST shined. So I think they started saying, hey, why don't we give these ships a name? They didn't receive the respect that they deserved. In many ways, that's symbolic of the all-out industrial mass production effort that so attended the Second World War. But in the post-war time period, the LSTs that were still commissioned finally received that respect and begin receiving names. They're named after counties and parishes of the United States. By 1984, the U.S. Merchant Marine sells the last of the World War II LSTs for scrap. But a group of senior citizen veterans decides LSTs are too important to be forgotten. After years of effort, they finally set sail on a journey that could and did put their lives on the brink. By the end of the 20th century, World War II ships are opening as museums all over the United States. But even in the 1990s, there is still not a single museum dedicated to the one ship that many are convinced won the war, the LST. A unique opportunity arises when, in 1995, Greece decides to replace their seven World War II-era LSTs. After years of red tape, 
a delegation of volunteers arrives to evaluate the specimens. They are determined to pick the one with the best hull. But the one with the best hull also happens to be in the worst shape in many other ways. And when the crew got over there to pick it up, they considered it to be more or less a pile of junk. And so there was a tremendous amount of uh, work just to get it in sailing order. And not, not knowing the structure of the ship, they had to be a little bit scary because you had no idea what the structure's like. The outside of it looked very rusty, and uh, the seams can be the same way. And uh, these ships are flat bottom, they roll a lot, and they bounce a lot, and they get a good chance of breaking seams. The ship was originally known as LST-325. In a lot of ways, LST-325 was a better choice than the newer one in that it was in the service from the beginning, built in 1942, commissioned in 1943, got into the first invasion at, at uh, Sicily in uh, July of 1943. So yes, it had a lot of history. This crew of 56 veterans arrives in Crete to restore the ship to a condition in which she can possibly make it back to the U.S. They are nearly all in their 60s and 70s. Some are there against doctor's orders, but they are living a dream, one last adventure. After five years of searching for a vessel, six years of red tape and planning, three months of repair work, and 50,000 gallons of fuel donated by a petroleum company, they set out from Suda Bay on November 14th, 2000, on their long journey across the Mediterranean Sea. Their destination, Mobile, Alabama. One thing about my crew, most of them had served three years on an LST. I think when you spend three years or even a year and you're in a war and getting shot at, and you're doing your job, uh, I don't think it's something you forget very easily. Almost immediately, they are plagued by problems. Just out of Athens, they lose an engine, a cracked manifold. The steering and the navigation gyro also stop functioning. Somehow, they limp into Gibraltar for 12 more days of repairs. Down to a crew of just 28 men with an average age of 72, they make their repairs and continue their transatlantic voyage. Against all odds, after two months at sea and 6,000 miles, LST 325 arrives in Mobile, Alabama, on schedule, January 10th, 2001. Give me goosebumps. Yes. The crew is stunned by their reception. We had the greatest reception in Mobile. And it was such a great thing to be an American that day, and uh, the relief that we finally made it. Today, LST-325 is a major tourist attraction, the only functioning LST in the United States. Restored to its 1940s incarnation, it receives 70,000 visitors a year. Before we went to get this ship, you didn't see anything about an LST. I think we, we brought that respect back. Churchill one time said that it was the, uh, the ship that won the war because without the LSTs, they couldn't have made all these invasions. And LSTs were really the workhorse of the Navy. It was built to carry equipment, fight the, fight the enemy. And they did a damn good job. <laughs>